Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. Happy 4th of July. It is. It's the 4th of July today. So let me be the first to say happy birthday, America. <laughs> America is 244 years old today. That is a long time for a nation to remain free. And yet in our nation's history, we've only spanned four generations. It's true. Uh, think about it. When Thomas Jefferson died, Abraham Lincoln was a young man of 17. And when Lincoln was assassinated, Woodrow Wilson was a boy of eight. By the time the nation mourned the death of President Wilson, Ronald Reagan was already 12. And when you stand back and look at the bigger picture of the world and its history, America is still a child compared to other nations like Egypt and China, Japan, Rome, or Greece. They all had much longer histories, but they were not as free. So happy birthday to America. It has a rich and spiritual history that we continue to enjoy and celebrate today. Think about this. On the very first Thanksgiving, who do you think it was the people were giving thanks to? God. My Country Tis of Thee was written by a Baptist minister, Samuel Francis Smith. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 by a Baptist minister, Francis Bellamy. What about the words, in God we trust? You can trace those back to Reverend W.R. Watkinson, and that motto was later adopted by Congress in 1956. And Reverend John Witherspoon, who was a Presbyterian minister, was even a signer on the Declaration of Independence. Our first president, George Washington, took an oath of office and placed his hand on what? The Bible. And even presidents today who are elected, they will continue to do that tradition. And when they place their hand on that Bible, they say, so help me God. George Washington's first official act as president, he kissed the Bible and then he held a two hour praise and worship session in Congress. In 1776, 11 of the 13 colonies required that you be a Christian even to be eligible to run for political office. In 1777, the Continental Congress voted to spend $300,000 on Bibles to distribute to the nation. In the Gettysburg Address, it states, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. The Liberty Bell has part of Leviticus 2510 inscribed on it, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Part of Proverbs 14 is inscribed on the Los Angeles City Hall door. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Did you know that Moses carrying the Ten Commandments, that engraving faces the Speaker of the House? And the Supreme Court begins each session with, a, with the phrase, God save the United States and this honorable court. In fact, the state constitutions of all 50 states mention God. Not to mention that in over 90% of the writings from our founding fathers contain quotes from the Bible. Our sixth president, John Quincy Adams said, no book in the world deserves to be so unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated upon as the Bible. Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president and governor of New Jersey said, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness, which are derived from the revelations of the Holy Scripture. Harry Truman, our 33rd president, said if men and nations would but live by the precepts of the ancient prophets and the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, problems which now seem so difficult would soon disappear. Gerald Ford, our 38th president, quoted a 1955 speech by Dwight D. Eisenhower on December 5th, 1974. Without God, there would be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Thus, the founding fathers of America saw it, and thus, with God's help, it will continue to be. President Ronald Reagan said, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation gone under. Today is the 4th of July. So this morning we're gonna take a break 
from our summer study, we're going to focus on celebrating our nation's Independence Day, our nation's birthday. From fireworks and rousing music to stuffing yourself with red, white, and blue food, there's no end to the fun that you can have on America's birthday. But before we stuff ourselves with barbecue and grab a cold one from the cooler, before we start blasting Leonard Skinner on our truck stereo, I wanted to offer three things for the Christian to remember on this national holiday. Listen to what Peter says. 1 Peter 2, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. What is Peter's point? We are to respect our governing authority. We are. We are to respect those who are over us. Now, you might say, well, when Peter wrote that, he didn't have a president like so-and-so, or a leader like so-and-so, or a governor like so-and-so. Actually, the book of 1 Peter was written during the reign of Emperor Domitian. And Domitian was perhaps the worst and most cruelest, murderous, anti-Christian dictator of any world later. Some historians have even compared him to Saddam Hussein. Domitian suffered from deep suspicion and paranoia. He was partially suspicious of the Senate, and he had a number of leading citizens executed for a conspiracy against him, which included 12 politicians and two of his own cousins. Domitian's rule became worse, and he eventually asked to be treated as a god. He banished Greek philosophers into exile, and he even arranged for one woman to be buried alive in a special box that he had made just for her. What a great guy. How did he die? Uh, his wife paid one of their palace servants to stab him. <laughs> Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing authority, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. And Paul writes that under Nero. Remember Nero, the guy who killed his wife, killed his mother, killed Christians by the thousands, the guy who played the fiddle while Rome burned? So that's two of Jesus' disciples telling us that to obey the government is to obey God. And each one of them lived under one of the cruelest, most notorious, pagan, most satanic leaders who ever lived. Always obey? Well, the only exception is when God and government disagree. That's what Peter told the Jewish Supreme Court when they ordered him to stop preaching in Jesus' name, and he told them, we must obey God rather than man. See, when God and government have a conflict, you as the Christian, of course, must choose to obey God. But if there is no conflict, obey your government and city officials as if you are obeying God himself. Colossians 3 says, honor the Lord in everything you do. And that includes your political involvement and your interactions with law enforcement. Listen, if we are to live as one nation under God and the motto, in God we trust, that's on our money. Then we have to remember that God is the foundation of our nation's heritage. In 1814, when Francis Scott Key wrote The Star-Spangled Banner, he was on a ship 10 miles out to sea viewing a 42 by 30 foot flag that hung on a pole. It was 180 feet in the air over Fort McHenry. The flag was gigantic, but that's what allowed Key to see it from 10 miles away. For years, people wondered how such a large flag could fly in stormy weather without snapping a pole. And then in 1958, National Park Service personnel discovered something buried nine feet below ground 
near the entrance to Fort McHenry. It was two oak timbers, eight foot by eight foot joined as a cross. That discovery located the exact place from which the Star Spangled Banner flew, but it also solved the mystery. The cross-shaped support provided the firm foundation for the symbol of our nation's freedom. Do you realize that the very framework of our nation's government was patterned after the Bible? We have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. That was a new concept for a national government in a world that lived back then. So where did they get the idea? They went to the Bible and they looked at Isaiah chapter 33. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and he will save us. Judge, that's the judicial branch. Lawgiver, that's the legislative branch. King, that's the executive branch. Our founding fathers looked to the word of God to organize our government as a nation. They laid the foundation, and we are built upon it. Look at 1 Timothy 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Notice for who? For kings and all who are in high positions. Why? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. See, Paul takes it even a step further. He says that we should go so far as to pray for our leaders. Do you? Do you pray for our leaders regardless of who sits in the chair? Why should we pray for them? Well, because their actions reflect on us. They represent us, and as the book of Timothy reminds us, it's so that we can live a godly and dignified life. That means we celebrate our patriotism by living a righteous life. We are to live righteous lives. Proverbs 14 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, I know there's many of us who are worried about the direction our nation has been going these past five to 10 years. It seems like everything is getting worse, not better. But listen, if you wanna change the direction that America is headed, then we need to do our part by living as an example. Just like Paul writes in Timothy, the goal is peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified. We want that for every American. How do we do this? By living the example that this country was built on, a life of holiness and righteousness. If you think the world is getting worse, the best thing we can do is not follow. Continue to hold the line, to continue to take a stand. First Peter 2 says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Last week we said, Christians should live differently. Knowing Jesus and having Jesus in our lives should make us different. Peter says, live holy and get rid of malice. What's malice? Well, if the world seems like a hateful place sometimes, guess what? Christians are not supposed to hate. Wishing somebody would have something bad happen to them. Bitterness wishing someone ill. That's not us. Jesus even went so far in Matthew 5, and he said, pray for your enemies. Peter says, live holy and get rid of deceit. In other words, stop lying. Stop falsely flattering someone. Stop making false promises, false tales, implying or suggesting falsehoods about someone else, or just outright lying to better yourself. How will the world believe our testimony about Jesus if we don't tell the truth. Peter says, live holy and get rid of hypocrisy. A hypocrite puts on a show, pretends to be something that they're not. Christians don't need to put themselves on display. We need to put Christ on display. Peter says, get rid of envy. Why? Because an envious person doesn't have peace or happiness 
Because an envious person is always dissatisfied with what they have and they are always wanting what somebody else has. We need to learn to be content in all situations because we want the world to see that we are dependent on God for our joy. Last, Peter says, don't slander, don't criticize, don't judge, don't backstab or gossip or censor or condemn or just grumble about this or that. Their fellow Christians, their fellow Americans, we are all supposed to be on the same side. You are holy, live righteously. The righteous person is really the only truly free person. And the last thing I'd like you to remember is that we might pledge our allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, but we are to maintain dual citizenship. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 22. When the Pharisees went and plotted about how to entangle Jesus with his words, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. See, regardless of what part of the world a Christian lives in, we always have dual citizenship. For most of us, we are citizens of our mother country and we are also children of God. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are physically born into one and we are spiritually born into the other. For those of us who are citizens of the United States and have also been born from above, then we are doubly blessed. We already mentioned that the citizens of the U.S. Uh, for us, it's our responsibility to obey and support our local government and our leaders. But Jesus even argues in this passage that we should go even further by supporting the government with our tax dollars. Jesus says, pay your taxes, right? So just to recap, the Bible says to obey our country's leaders, to pray for them, to pray for the enemies of our country, and to pay your taxes. Listen, Today is the day we sing those songs, we watch fireworks, and I love the stars and stripes just as much as the next person. I'm as patriotic for the US as you. I love my country, and I know many of you share these strong feelings of pride for our country. However, my first allegiance is as a citizen of the kingdom of God. We need to be reminded where our heavenly citizenship lies and what our responsibilities are to the kingdom, our first allegiance. You know, another popular slogan that we hear all year long is God bless America. But what about us? Maybe the United States isn't all that it should be. And far too many may be going in the wrong direction. We may even have the wrong attitude about America. Some question how she is being corrupted or why. Others would say, how did she get this way? And others just want to get all they can out of America and not think about anyone else. But the Christian, we shouldn't be asking, how did America get this way? Instead, we should be asking, how can I make America better? How can I bless America? Let's pray. Lord God and heavenly King, you alone are the Lord of the earth and King of the universe. And you alone can revive and restore the United States of America and bring us under your authority and your word. Give our president, together with his advisors and the whole of his administration, the wisdom and grace to follow. And may they set this nation on the path of trusting in you. Motivate 
all our Congress to strive for integrity and wisdom in all the choices and decisions they make. And may those that are entrusted as judges and lawmakers likewise act in righteousness, impartiality, and integrity as they work for the benefit of all people and to the honor of your holy name. May America always be at the forefront in the defense of all human rights, especially the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Lord, we pray for the members of our Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, and Air Force. Keep them from harm. We also pray for the families, relatives, and friends of our military members. We ask that they be strengthened in times of concern and anxiety and help our Armed Forces family cope with the daily challenges in the absence of their loved ones. We also come to you today thankful for the men and women who are our doctors and first responders, who serve and protect us around the clock. We rest better each night and we go about our daily lives in safety, knowing that these great citizens are always a phone call away. Lastly, good and gracious God, you invite us to recognize the beauty of your divine image and to see that likeness in our neighbor. Enable us to see the cruelty of division and how badly racism and conflict hurt us as one nation under God. Free us to change. Challenge us to uproot hate from our society, from even our world and ourselves. Heavenly King, we place this day and our nation at your feet. And we pray that we may once again serve you as a united states. May your will be done in America and all across the world. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful, terrific holiday. Happy 4th of July. Thank you for watching and spending this time with us. Of course, you can like this video. You can always subscribe to this channel. Please feel free to clip and copy the URL and post it to your wall or a friend's wall who you think might benefit from today's lesson. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.